Welcome to Intelligent Automation Radio, the number one podcast for IT executives seeking insights on the impact and opportunities for innovation that automation is delivering to businesses around the world. Featuring thought leaders in AI, machine learning, orchestration, security automation, and the future of work. And now, on with the show. Welcome, everyone. My name is Guy Nadivi, and I'm the host of Intelligent Automation Radio. Our guest on today's episode is Marisa Kokenhauer, Head of Automation Advisory at Cognizant, one of the world's largest MSPs. Marisa is an expert on accelerating and scaling enterprise automation programs, which has taken on greater importance over the last year as the pandemic itself accelerated corporate digital transformations. She was also recently named Innovator of the Year at the Women in IT Award for 2020, and we're very excited to have her on the podcast. Marisa, welcome to Intelligent Automation Radio. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. Marisa, can you please share with us a bit about what path you took that led you to be the head of automation advisory at Cognizant? Yeah, absolutely. It's interesting because I feel like my path might have been a bit less conventional to get here. I did get into the technology and engineering early on, so my degree was in. But as I got into my, my working world and my future of work, I guess you could say, I got more into the operations side. I spent a lot of time working even supply chain, learning about Lean Six Sigma and process improvement. And what really started to catch my attention was just the impact you could have on how people's work was being done, that you can actually help them make their work easier for them. And as I went through my career, I started to get into more of the data space, understanding metrics and analytics, and then I ended up standing up an automation program uh, in my career. And I found that it was this really nice segue between business and IT and technology. And if I think back to my earlier days in the Lean Six Sigma world, we always had opportunities that we felt required some technology intervention. And for me, this automation space was exactly that. And after getting my program to work and seeing the benefits that you could drive in a company, I came over to Cognizant where I was excited to get the opportunity to really put in a program that complemented the already very deep domain expertise we had on delivery and how we integrated technologies to add this advisory component so that we could help clients along this journey, get bigger outcomes, drive more results, really embed this technology into how companies were working and help accelerate their digital journey. You're a graduate of GE's Operations Management Leadership Program, and I heard you speaking on another podcast about how one of your biggest takeaways from that experience was empowering people and teams by teaching them how to fish, metaphorically, of course. With that in mind, what do you think are the prospects for a future of work filled with citizen developers, thanks to the democratization of automation? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. This has really come to the forefront, especially over the last year, this concept of citizen development. How do you empower people? You know, if I take a step back, I think this even goes a little bit into some of the, the Lean Six Sigma piece that I was talking about, where we embedded that mindset into an organization. We, we taught people as a Kaizen and even created career pathing for them. So they could either be a part of it in their roles, could even as they move through their career, become black belts, master black belts. When I think about the citizen development space, that's what we're doing. We're actually empowering the people and putting the technology into their hands so that they can look at what are, what are you doing today that you would like to have automated? What would you like to just click a button and get the results for versus spending hours to let a report download and then having to manipulate some files and maybe consolidate 20 plus tables in Excel and then only to find out one of the reports maybe didn't run completely so you have to go back and start that journey. The idea here is we want to be able to empower these people in the business to be able to have this automation at their fingertips so that they can actually go and automate that work. So they could go and focus on higher valued work, whether it's maybe to give new products, new ways to engage with customers, other ways to analyze business processes to maybe impact the bottom line or grow the top line. And I think the other thing here is, you know, the citizen development concept, while it's really exciting, I, I've also seen a lot of organizations be a little bit hesitant to go down the path to give everyone, you know, the power at their fingertips. But, you know, I think part of it's also how do you move them along the journey? How do you help them understand the technology is really important. And that's actually how you can raise that digital IQ across the organization. Just to give an example of how powerful this can be, 
You know, we were actually working in a pharma company where they are putting automation into some of the processes that's around clinical trials. So you actually have scientists who have to run reports. They have to be able to manipulate lots of data. They have to be able to go look at where in the supply chain are all the drugs at at any given time to make sure that they're um, aligning all of that to where their patients are at. We are actually able to go and with their knowledge, help them get all of that work automated. So what you actually did is you just took months of analysis and reduced it down for them. The great thing about that is you just allowed those scientists to be scientists. You might actually be able to help get a drug to market faster. That may help you know, get treatments for whether it's COVID right now quicker, or you may have an impact even how quickly we can help advance cancer research. So when I think about this space of democratizing autom automation, it's really about empowering people and adding that value back into organizations. Marie says, you know, sometimes introducing automation into an organization can trigger resistance from some employees due to fear of job loss or radical job change. We refer to that resistance here on the podcast as robophobia, and it can in fact pose a serious cultural obstacle for enterprises deploying automation on their digital transformation journey. What tactics have you seen prove most effective in overcoming robophobia? You know, it's funny, Guy, I don't think the movies really help with this robophobia very much. <laughs> um, so when we think about this, I think one is understanding that some of the fear of robots that's out there is some of it's driven because of misunderstanding. Some of it is that fear of impact to job. And I think there's a couple of things we have to think about. One is recognize how we work today is probably not going to be how we work tomorrow. We are going to continue to automate a lot of this work. And there's a lot of it's because we need to be able to think about how do you actually integrate these technologies? We're moving to cloud. We continue to bring in new technologies to help throughout a process. Maybe it's also how we, in, we um, interact with our customers as well. And so as you think about that, I think one is, if we're gonna help people kind of face this fear and concern, one, we need to be upfront and honest with them. That yes, this is gonna change how we work. But what's really exciting about this is that there's so much evolution in this space and there's so much opportunity to actually be a part of the solution. You'll find to, to be a part of this automation and digital journey, you don't have to necessarily have a technical degree. There's a lot of roles that you can play where you're a part of finding opportunities. You're working alongside the development teams to make sure that we get all those business exceptions in. Thinking about as we put these digital workers into place, what will that look like for managers who maybe will have these as part of their team? Employees who are gonna work alongside those digital workers. And I think it's really important that we think about how the impact of change management will be within the organization. Taking the time to explain the technology, let people see it. I have actually seen when you go into these organizations and you do workshops with them and you show them how it's going to work, you see this massive shift from maybe some hesitation, you actually see excitement. Because a lot of what we're automating also is work that people don't really enjoy doing today anyway in their jobs. If most of the stuff that you know, we put off, we don't want to do, we complain about as we you know, have our cup of coffee or chat with a friend that we wish we didn't have to do that type of work. Automation actually is going to free up people's time so they can actually go and think about innovation. You could have people in finance, you know, think about business impact and strategy or give time back to a service agent to actually work with the customer versus just go download and find reports and key information. So, you know, I think the big, the big uh, fact here or the big item to really look at to overcome this phobia is one, be honest and upfront about it, explain it. Second, you know, demystify it by showing people. And third, really bring people on the journey, let them be a part of the solution. We're hearing more and more about process mining and other AI-based discovery platforms being deployed as part of digital transformations. How do you think these tools are impacting adoption rates for automation? Yeah, these ones have really been up and coming, especially over the course of the last year. We've actually spent quite a bit of time investing and making sure we're trained. We have a lot of folks on these technologies because what you'll find is that a lot of organizations have struggled to get outcomes and ensure they're getting results. A lot of that's because a lot of companies did grow through acquisition. They have a lot of systems. There's a lot of processes. And one of the really helpful things about process mining and AI-based discovery tools or task mining is that it actually gives you objective data insights into your process. 
what is the critical path? What are those exceptions? Where are there opportunities at the top level of your organization for automation as well as the task mining getting into this individual level of information? So I think this area is actually gonna really help accelerate automation because it's helping you pinpoint those opportunities. And the other thing that's important is it's actually giving you that end-to-end -end view. A lot of times when you're getting into automation, you get into a lot of the, the task piece of it, but I'll call that more the, the belly button view. What that means is automation that will help just me as an individual. These tools actually help you look across the organization and find those areas that are maybe similar across the team. Maybe it's 20, 30% of the process actually has some similarity to it. So you can build the code once and then deploy it at scale. Then it helps you find what are those next areas to go target to get you the bigger results and make those connections for you. So I think these are really gonna to be tools that help us accelerate the automation journey and increase those adoption rates for organizations. Marisa, you've talked elsewhere about the triple A trifecta of automation, analytics, and AI, also referred to by some as hyper automation. Now, to one extent or another, all these disciplines rely on data scientists. And I saw a recent infographic uh, from QuantHub stating that in 2020, there was a deficit of 250,000 data scientists relative to jobs available. How will companies like Cognizant and its customers overcome this staggering talent shortage? Yeah, so I think one thing I would say about this industry is it is definitely a hot topic. There's so much need and there's so much um, requests for talent. And the nice thing about it is it's not really the knowledge gaps that we're facing. It's to your exact point is there's just high demand. There's a couple of things that we're doing to overcome it. One is we're focused a little bit more on cross-training than we've seen in the past. A lot of times folks would come in and say, you know, they're an expert on one technology. The idea here is actually we want to be able to upskill and multi-skill our teams to be able to work on multiple technologies. So it enables this AAA trifecta or the hyper automation. It actually helps too when it comes to the way you integrate across processes as well. A lot of times you'll need more than one technology to really get the maximum benefits out of it. I think the other thing that we've seen is a little bit of shift in mindset. So a lot of times you'll find that to do the really more complex advanced integrations, you are gonna need someone who has a deep expertise. But you're also gonna find this space has some up and coming technology. Some of it's even new to the industry. There's some startups that are coming in. So one thing we've seen is actually how do you bring in maybe recent college grads, the pipeline talent into the organization so that you can actually pair them up with those folks who have those years of experience and teach them and bring them along. We actually even see a lot of our clients doing the same because what it's doing is it's actually doing two things. One, it's helping fill this pipeline, uh, this talent gap that we're having. The second thing is it's also helping bring just that diversity of thought into the ecosystem early on, because you'll find that as folks new coming in who maybe haven't worked on these technologies as long, they're picking up things like agile even faster because they like to ask why. They want to work faster. They want to see those results come quicker. So I think that's another piece that's really critical to be able to address this gap. And then I think the last piece is that, I feel like what you mentioned a moment ago, this citizen development concept. I think that's also why people are so excited about it, because you will find in this space, Integrating technology is going to be very you know, challenging. It takes a lot of work. But the part that's really hard about this is actually bringing together the people so they understand the technology, find the opportunities. The next piece of that is you're re-engineering the processes as you're laying in the automation, analytics, and AI technologies too. So if you're able to actually uplift and find those people that can help with that that mindset of how do I layer a process that's optimal to be able to apply automation and AI to it, it also helps some of the gap you have on the backside with the development piece of finding these folks who can actually integrate and apply the technologies because you're making it easier for them to move faster. What do you think are the keys to integrating automation, analytics, and AI to bridge silos within an enterprise so hyper-automation delivers on its promise? Yeah, this one is one that I've seen a lot of folks have some challenges with because we're naturally siloed in our organizations. Think about it, we have finance functions, HR functions, you have business units, you have teams, and we're not always aligned perfectly at all of our metrics and KPIs and, and how we work. We don't even know sometimes who we're handing off to down or upstream in a process, or if we do, maybe we don't know the person five down from us. 
And it's just because it's hard. Organizations are big, processes are very complex. You have a lot of things to consider when you get into regions and globes and country, all those different factors that come into play. When you move into the automation analytics and AI, you still have a lot of silos in just how we implement the technology, how we work with our business partners. And one of the things here is you bring you together is a couple of things. One, it's very important to bring a business and IT sponsors to the table. You want to give that joint mindset on vision on how we're going to work together. You're going to want to think about end to end in the process, actually looking at it that way and being able to have that connection top down on where are my opportunities, where are those handoffs. And that's actually getting combined then with that grassroots opportunity. So when you marry those up, that's where you get the really big benefits. Let me just give you an example of where you see, see more come out of this when you think this way. So one example I would give is around claims processing. When we first started working with an insurance provider, we saw that ideas came in to just help with the data entry. You had multiple systems you had to enter information into. There's a lot of different rules that you would apply depending on what state you were in. But what we did with them is we sat down and we said, look, let's think a little bit broader on your whole process end to end, the whole way from when someone is actually entering a claim as your customer, through on the back end where you're getting that final payout to them, or you know, you get the information, the update on the status of that claim. When we laid it out that way, instead of just automating pieces of the process, what we actually are able to do is we realized the whole way from when someone said, you know, maybe I slipped and I hurt my arm, they entered that claim into the system. We're able to look at say we could take natural language analytics, pull that information out using automation and RPA, enter all that information to systems. We then even could apply the rules to all the states and countries and counties and everything into it. So they applied all of that. The whole way through giving actually a viewpoint to those agents so they could see the status of everyone's claims coming in, teaching the models how to even get smarter to make sure we are being very accurate. We had to have perfect accuracy on this process. As it went through, what we were able to do is we were able to first automate a very high percentage of straight through processing, 60, 70%. By adding in that machine learning AI in the back end, we got up to the 95 plus percent. And now that's an automated process for that organization. But it took us stepping back and helping bridge some of those uh, silos and that those different teams to be able to find that bigger opportunity for the organization. Marisa, speaking of specific projects, you've been involved with quite a few automation use cases at Cognizant. So I'm curious if there's any particular one that stands out for its deliverables or its scale as the most successful business process you've seen automated. Sure. There's, there's quite a few that come to mind on ones that we're you know, really excited to see the outcomes, but there's, there's probably one that stands out to me. I think it's because as they went through their journey, they had you know, started and stopped a few times. They, they started back early when RP and everything had actually started around the 2016, 2015 mark. And they hadn't seen the outcomes they had wanted. So when we got to talk with them, they said, look, we want to, we really want to make this work. We want to scale this across the enterprise and we want to see, we want to see results. So we helped them put in their, their COE. Basically, we put in a central model for them first. And we brought their, their CIO to the table. They had sponsorship on their business side, and we started working with them to scale across their organization. And what was really exciting about that one and why it stands out so much was not only did they get a multifold return, they're actually seeing um, an ROI of uh, millions of dollars every year on their investment. They are driving opportunities with all their business stakeholders. They have folks from every business at the table. They've created champions in the organization. But I think the part that stands out to me is I've sat in one of their reviews before, and I've listened to business and IT come to a table with very senior leaders talking about how they can cross share across their different business units, where they thought there was opportunities in other teams. To me, that, that shows that we got it embedded. It's just how they work today. And you continue to see this, this ongoing scale for them and this implementation of true hyper automation, they're connecting chat with RPA to analytics, to AI and ML models, and they're getting the results. And to me, that's what really kind of stands out is that they, they really got into just how they work as an organization. COVID-19 made 2020 a challenging year for a lot of organizations. 
What do you think are the biggest lessons that enterprises learned from the pandemic with regards to automation? Sure. I think one thing was, um, one thing we all realized is working remote was actually maybe not as bad as we all thought it was going to be at first. It actually helped us to be able to move faster, be more nimble with our teams. But I think a few other things that we really realized and we saw clients starting to notice is one, automation is a lever for much more than just efficiencies and cost plays. Business resiliency can be impacted. It allows organizations to put in an ability to adapt more quickly to disruption, find those bigger outcomes and address challenges in the organization. So it really became more of an enabler. I think the other thing that we saw was just the way people worked was different. We've talked a lot about agile in the past and applying it, but one thing that we really saw is people really took it to heart. They said, how do you help me get benefits today? It's okay if we get only partially way there. Let's then work and iterate to be able to continue to add value and further that needle. But I really need that help and benefits today. You know, if I think about one of the examples there, we were working with an airline where at the start of COVID, they had such an increase in the number of cancellations that what they saw in just a day was more than they would have seen in a month, typically. So they just weren't able to handle that type of volume overnight. So we were able to put in automation in just about six days for them. And now it's clearing in a day what used to take a month. So it alleviated the stress that came onto that team. And that team is actually now working in other areas to help drive value back for their customers through other different uh, methods, whether it's responses to updates in their status, whether it is around a request that came in for them, but the impact was just so different for them. And for them, they actually said, look, I want to work this way moving forward. And that's, you know, that's one example of a customer, but we've seen that just across industries and across client examples where they said, you know, we really do want to work in this more agile, nimble way. Marisa, I'm sure many of our female listeners would love to hear from you about what your experience has been like as a woman and an executive in the technology field. You know, it's interesting. I, I started uh, in engineering and then I, I moved to multiple worlds and I actually found my way back into technology. I went to ops for a while. And I would say a couple of things, you know, really stood out to me was how important first off it was to find a really strong network as I moved through my career. Someone I could lean on, we could, I could reach out to, I can get that coaching, mentoring advice. It was actually um, a woman I worked for back in my GE days that encouraged me to come back over to data and technology. And uh, she's retired now, but I, I thank her for it every day because it's just been so exciting and I love the space. And I think the other thing is that it's really encouraging to see how far we've come. I know we still have a ways to go, but you know, being someone who was one of very few in the room as an engineer, I see more women coming to the table now, which is exciting. Um, even talking to my grandma, who's in her late 90s now, she's always amazed to hear about what I do and what others are doing, because these weren't roles that were options for her growing up. And I think, you know, if I were to step back and think about you know, the female listeners that are out there um, thinking about, do I want to get into technology or how do I keep advancing my career? I think one, very importantly, find those coaches and mentors and also be someone who is also uplifting your fellow woman, encourage folks to get into this field help them answer questions, help them help folks look for diverse talent. And, it's, you know, there's actually beyond women too. I think it's important also to look for those new individuals coming into space, help them grow, and then find, you know, others also with uh, diverse backgrounds. It really makes an impact to the teams that you're on. And I think the other thing I would say is I've always tried to do this by encourage folks to, you know, be those change agents. We all have unconscious bias. Sometimes we, don't, we see things that happen and people don't realize maybe the impact something that was said or words and take the time to continue to explain and help um, people understand ways to help bring up other women, help them encourage, help them learn. I think that's actually how we continue to all move forward together better. Are there any advantages to being a woman in the technology field? You know, when I think about this, I just, I always kind of step back. I think, you know, in general, I think there's just really importance to diversity and inclusion in the workplace. Um, I think beyond kind of just, you know, being a woman as an individual, but the whole. So when I think about that, I'll, you know, just having diverse backgrounds in teams, I think having women, having folks with different, you know, across age groups, across backgrounds, ethnicities, et cetera. I think that's actually really what's more important. Because um, when I think about it, 
I'm not sure if I really say that it's just an advantage. I think more as a whole, we have an advantage when we have that diverse thinking um, that's at the table for us. And I think it's important. We just have to keep encouraging, you know, women to come into the space. We have to think about the younger generation and how to maybe bring people into this technology space full of science and math that, you know, I think sometimes folks can be a little bit intimidated by, but there's really a lot of opportunity here. And I think you're looking for folks to come in who are just, you know, looking for that, how do I make an impact quickly? It's a very fast paced world. And I, to me, I think it's really just about how do we bring that diversity to the table? Cause that's really going to be where the advantage comes from. To follow up on that, what can be done to get more women and more diversity in general into technology and succeeding in the field? Yeah, I think there's, there's so many good things going on in organizations today with the focus and movement around diversity and inclusion. You know, I, I see leadership programs like we have in Cognizant that help actually take our talent of diverse folks, you know, women, folks coming up in the pipeline, actually giving them mentorship, helping them advance their careers. I benefited from that early on in my career, GE being a part of leadership programs. I think the other thing is, you know, one, if you see someone in the organization, take the time to reach out to them. You know, be that mentor, be that coach. A lot of, of individuals, um, with girls with background, are actually very nervous to reach out to someone proactively. Uh, so, you know, being someone who's going to reach out, it actually sets the tone. I think leading by example is also very important. You know, focus on building those diverse teams. You know, work on how do we recruit um, diverse candidates. Talking to your HR teams on why that's important. You know, working with your recruiting teams. Being that champion for others is important. Um, and also being an ally as well. It doesn't necessarily mean you have to, you know, have that exact background to, you know, appreciate someone else's journey. But I think taking the time to understand and help them and listen, I think is really important. And, and it goes really a long way. Um, I actually think back to when I was in different affinity groups throughout my career, I was always in, first as a little surprised, but then I was so impressed to see like in a women's group, we had men that were joined too, because they were allies for us. And I think it's important because they even said, you know, I got to actually hear different perspectives and that helped raise their awareness. And that actually encouraged me to encourage myself to actually join other groups too, because I think that's actually how we remove some of those unconscious biases that we have. And also, you know, encourage women and folks from different backgrounds to, you know, have a voice and be vocal and, you know, bring more of them to the table and, in my viewpoint, let's encourage when we get into the technology field. A lot of opportunities here. Marisa, for the CIOs, CTOs, and other IT executives listening in, what is the one big must-have piece of advice you'd like them to take away from our discussion with regards to implementing automation at their organization? Sure. I would say, you know, first off, when you think about, you know, a digital strategy, Automated intelligence, you know, it's not the only level lever for that intelligent um, digital strategy they're implementing, but it's a really vital piece. And as they're thinking about it, you know, one, there's definitely the component of how do you integrate the technology. I think that's going to be core to a lot of those today in your IT technology digital organizations. The one piece I would say if I were to really give them a piece of advice just to consider is how do you bridge that gap between the business and IT teams? As you think about automation you're going to need to have that business expertise also at the table, bringing them along the journey, because those folks are going to have the depth to those really deep levels on why are we doing the business process the way it is? What are those rules, regulations? And when you bring that knowledge with that technical depth, that's where you're able to get those synergies across teams. And you're going to go from having benefits and outcomes to really exponential outcomes. So I would say, you know, think about when implementing what is that business process owners that you could find as champions within your organization? And then how do you empower your people to be those change agents, helping them find those solutions, being a part of building them out, and then ultimately, you know, really making sure that they integrate and sustain and embed into just how people work to make it successful. All right. Well, it looks like that's all the time we have for on this episode of Intelligent Automation Radio. Marisa, it's been a real treat tapping into your insights on automation and uh, many other topics. And I'm sure you gave our audience a lot to ponder today. Thank you so much for coming on to the show. Thank you so much, guys, for having me. I really enjoyed the time today. Marisa Kokenauer, Head of Automation Advisory at Cognizant. 
Thank you for listening, everyone. And remember, don't hesitate. Automate. Thank you so much for listening today. Please subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, SoundCloud, Spotify, or anywhere else you listen to podcasts. We publish new shows regularly, and you won't want to miss one. And please remember to give us a rating. It helps others find the show. Intelligent Automation Radio is sponsored by IEHU, the leader in intelligent automation solutions for IT and cybersecurity. You can get more information about IEHU by visiting our website at IEHU.com. That's A-Y-E-H-U.com. IEHU, creating the successful path to the self-driving enterprise.